Good morning, Bedford Church of the Nazarene. We're so glad today. We're so glad that you decided to worship here this morning. Glad that you got up, you got out of bed, and you were joyfully worshiping today. As you walked in this morning, you might be looking around thinking, man, where is everybody? Where's Pastor Mike? Where's Pastor Ben? Where's Matt? Where'd they go? Well, this weekend uh, is our district pastors and spouses retreat. And so thank you so much for allowing us as staff to be able to be a part of something like that. And we would just like to take the opportunity to say thanks. So here's Pastor, Pastor Ben, and Matt just telling you thank you for allowing them to go away on the pastor and spouses retreat this weekend. Hi, friends. This is Pastor Mike. As you're watching this, uh, you're sitting there in the sanctuary, but several members of the staff have the privilege of being at our district uh, pastors and spouses retreat that's held every fall. Normally we attend Friday and Saturday and come back because of Sunday worship, but this year we were given the opportunity to stay over uh, for the Sunday morning worship time with our fellow pastors and their spouses and with our district superintendent. And so we just wanna say thank you Thanks for being such a great church. Thank you for being so supportive of all of us and our ministries. And thank you for allowing us this time to regenerate and recharge a little bit. And we'll be back next week, ready to serve the Lord with you and ready to worship him with you. Again, I just wanna say thanks so much for being the kind of church that you are. We love you and uh, we miss you. We'll see you next week. Hey, good morning, church family. Um, I hope you guys are excited to be in the Lord's house this morning and worshiping. Um, I know that Pastor Ben Lee has a great message prepared for you guys, um, but I just want to take a moment and tell you guys, thank you so much uh, for allowing me and my wife, Rachel, uh, to get away this weekend at a pastors and spouses retreat, as well as the rest of the pastoral staff. Um, I can't thank you guys enough um, as volunteers and as church members, as leaders uh, for stepping up and just being a part of the church body. Um, but we just want to thank you for the opportunity to get away, to rejuvenate, to re-energize, um, and come back refreshed to serve and to love on you guys. Um, I know that God is doing and preparing to do some amazing things in our church, and I hope you guys are excited to see uh, how he moves and what's going to happen. So just thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts uh, for the opportunity to get away um, and to refresh. So have a blessed week, and we'll see you guys soon. Hey, guys, Matt here. Just want to say thank you for um, letting us get away this weekend and retreat. It's always a good time to be away, and especially on a Sunday, just have some time off and um, just be with my wife and my my, uh, my parents also go and Pastor Mike. It's kind of iffy if I even want to see him, but I guess I can. Um, anyways, seriously, just thank you so much for that. So yes, thank you so much for allowing us to be able to get away, uh, to be able to just be with other pastors and their spouses and their families, and just to be able to worship together this weekend. So thank you for that opportunity. As you know, we are fully into October, and at the end of this month, on the 31st, we will be doing Trunk and Treat. Now, as the last time I looked at the sign-up sheet, there were only four people signed up to decorate a trunk. We've got lots of candy coming in, and thank you for that. But we need more people to decorate trunks for Trunk and Treat. It'd be really pathetic if there were only four of us that showed up, and I'm one of the four. It'd be really pathetic for, for myself and our family and three other families to, to, to show up on, on October 31st from 6 to 8 to hand out candy. So we need you. If you can decorate a trunk, please, we would just ask that you would do it. So out of guest services, there'll be a sign-up sheet. And we just need you to sign up just to say that you're going to be able to decorate your trunk. Um, everything starts at 6 p.m., but we would ask you to be here by 5.30 so that you can decorate your trunk, get everything set, and ready to go by 6 p.m. on October 31st. Again, this is a great opportunity to minister to those in a fun, loving way of those people from our community. So make sure that you're here. Make sure you sign up. Make sure that you're bringing candy for Trunk and Treat on October 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. If you were here last Sunday, you saw the video where we began promoting Operation Christmas Child. Out in the foyer, there are plenty of boxes left that we would encourage you to grab a box, begin to fill that box for a little boy or a little girl in need. And so on the inside of that box, you'll see all of the information that you need to fill that box appropriately. You can catch the two locations out in the foyer to pick up a box 
And we just want to remind you that those boxes need to be back here no later than Sunday, November 24th, so that we can send them down to, uh, and I believe it's North Carolina, to ship those out to the kids in need for Christmas. So make sure that you grab a box, get it filled up, and get it back here no later than Sunday, November 24th. So with Pastor being absent today, we have a guest speaker. Ben Lee will be preaching this morning, and I hope that you enjoy what he's got to say. He's kind of filled me in on a few things that he's going to be mentioning, and one of them just might be our discipleship ministry. If you're not in a discipleship group, if you would have any interest in leading a discipleship group, or you just want more information about the discipleship groups, I want to challenge you to come see myself, maybe even find Gary Wisenhunt, and chat with him about um, how you can be involved with the, the discipleship groups. So if you want to contact me, please feel free to shoot me an email. You can do that at pdennis at bcn.org. And I would love to answer any questions you might have, or if you're interested in being involved in a group or, or leading a group, we need you. This church is about discipling people to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And we need all the people and all the help that we can to make sure that we achieve that goal. So if you're interested in discipleship today, I pray and I hope that you would become a part of the discipleship groups. And over and above that, I pray and I hope that you would bless Ben Lee by listening intently to his message today. And uh, that, that God would just speak through Ben to you to make an impact for his kingdom. So I pray that while the pastors are away this weekend, that you would enjoy the message and that you'd be encouraged and that you would do whatever you can do to be a part of a discipleship group here at Bedford Church of the Nazarene. Well, I know that's a lot of information for you to catch this morning, but I hope that you got everything you needed to stay up to speed in the life of our church. If you feel like you need more information, please visit our website at www.bcn.org. Again, we just want to say thank you for worshiping with us today. Thank you for being here, and we hope that you have a great and wonderful Sunday. Welcome to church. If you guys are happy to be here, say amen. Amen. And just so we don't miss uh, Pastor too much, if you're happy, happier than any cemetery in uh, Summit County. Is it Summit County? Cuyahoga County. Say amen. <laughs> amen. All right, will you stand with us today in worship? Thank you. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free, oh, is free and be, I'm a child of God, yes, I At last he has ransomed me, all oh, his grace from me. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, all oh, is free and I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. 
Oh uh-huh. 
it is well with me. Let's pray together. Oh God, I thank you and praise you for the chance to just come here this morning and meet with you. You are here for sure. And you are, God, we give you permission to just do some wonderful things today, to speak to our hearts and to speak through Pastor Ben Lee. God, I pray for uh, our church leadership as all of our pastors and spousers are away and are um, just enjoying a, 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 a pastor's and wife's retreat or spouse retreat that I pray that this is a time of refreshment and encouragement and that you would pour just extra measures of blessings into their lives, uh, uh, God, while they're there. God, I, I pray that you would be with us in the rest of this service and that you'd speak to our hearts. We love you. Amen. You can have a seat for a minute. I'll have the ushers come forward while I share just a couple of things. So pastors are away. They put the rookies on stage <laughs> today. Um, I, I wanted to take a minute and point out to us, this is Octo the month of October is Pastors Appreciation Month. And we're going to, uh, I, I, we, we are going to have, oh, ushers, if you want to go ahead and begin, I'll, I'll do a few announcements while I talk. Um, we're going to have a time to just celebrate and appreciate and love on our pastors following the second service on Sunday, October the 27th. And we're going to do a, a, a cookie and card reception. So what we're asking is if you'd be willing to make some cookies, two to three dozen cookies, there's a sign-up sheet in the back between the two coffee cans out there. Please stop out and and sign your name to that. And there's a little reminder card there as well that you can take to be able to do that. And for those of us like me, who am not good at making cookies, <laughs> I, I'm gonna make sure I fill a card with, with just some notes of encouragement and maybe a gift card or two to each one of our pastors to express how much we love and appreciate all that they're doing for us. Uh, it just kind of leading and guiding us both spiritually and, and physically here at Bedford Church of the Nazarene. So make sure you make a point to do that. Um, two more quick announcements for the Young Adults uh, REACH group. They are meeting today at 6 p.m. over in the mansion. And next Saturday, they've got a big event as well that uh, they're going to um, Ram Sayer Farms. Thank you very much. And they're meeting here at 1 o'clock. Last thing I wanted to say, one of the, one of the, I always measure my weeks. My friend Rich usually plays the electric guitar over here. We just have a, a praise. He's doing a little bit better. He's moved from the hospital into a rehabilitation center. And, and we've got some cards out there. If you wanted to sign a card of encouragement to him, they're over here on the information desk to your left. I'd, I'd ask that we all just stop and tell him how much we miss seeing him here and that we're praying for him to really do well. So with that, I think we're going to continue worship and I'll let you guys take over. Thank you. Show me who 
could ever see. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder, show me. Father, let his words be your words. God, help him to speak your truth with the boldness, Father. I also want to pray for everyone here this morning that we would just open our hearts and be fully receptive of what you have to say to us, God, that we would leave here changed and renewed. And it's in your precious, wonderful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Get this sound dialed down a little bit. And guys in the back, if I need to move or or uh, shimmy or wiggle anything to make this work, let me know. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, second service. I stood up here with the first service, said good morning, and then I said, probably 99% of you don't know me, and I don't know 99% of you. For the second service, where my family and I have been worshiping for the last two months, I'm going to dial that number back to about 92% of you don't know me and I don't know you. My hope is that this time next year, 
Uh, you have a much better sense of who my family is, and we have gotten to know you as well. Pastor Mike and I used to pastor, we were colleagues together on the same district about a decade or so ago. And um, when my family, as I'll tell you just in a minute here, made a, a commitment to relocate back to the Northeast Ohio, Cleveland area, knowing Pastor Mike as I did, knowing Paul as I did from our days in college, um, we knew this was going to be the first church we wanted to check out and become a, a worshiping uh, contributing member of, and we didn't leave after our first Sunday. And that is a testimony to each of you. We are finding a life here that we're really loving. So can I take about five or six minutes just to do a quick introduction? Consider this me talking to you over our first cup of coffee, and the next time we talk, you can talk to me all about you. So we'll just get me out of the way right here. Uh, you can see a photo up here of my family. Uh, we took this last Easter morning, most recently, my wife Marcy of 16 years, my daughter Zoe's a sixth grader, son Roman's in fourth grade, and my youngest son Samuel is in second grade. We started attending Bedford Church of the Nazarene in the middle of August of this year, but I've been a member of the global Church of the Nazarene all of my life. I was baptized at a very young age in the Bremerton, Washington Church of the Nazarene, which is where I started my life. As a second grader, my family moved to Juneau, Alaska, where I grew up in the great uh, northern state and lived my life as a, a member of the church that loved me there. After high school, I enlisted in the United States Army and um, 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 ended up traveling around the country and having all kinds of wonderful experiences. While I was in the Army, I ended up meeting a, a beautiful, lovely young woman from Tuscarawas County, Ohio. We fell in love with each other, and she convinced me to join her at Mount Vernon Nazarene University. We were married our, our, uh, while we were still college students, and then within our first year of marriage, we loaded up the U-Haul and drove down to Kansas City so I could attend seminary down there. Not long after that, we began pastoring some churches here and there and just about every conceivable role you could imagine, youth pastor, associate pastor, uh, all those kinds of things, uh, enjoyed those experiences. We even planted a church. You can see behind me, uh, we planted a church. It has a, a raised fist holding a flower as a logo. It was called the Resistance Church of the Nazarene. It was dialed in some intentionally funky ways to, to reach out to an unchurched audience. We had a blast doing that. Uh, it's also somewhere in about that time I, I uh, began... Um, going back and teaching at the university, becoming a, a professor of theology and, and some other things at Mount Vernon Nazarene University for about five years or so. And then through a variety of, of interesting reasons, I began to understand that I had more to offer the church, this beautiful gathering of people that I'd committed my life to loving and serving alongside of the church instead of in it. And so in 2015, my family and I moved to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where I became the director for Make-A-Wish's work in that part of the country. Love that experience. Did that until just this summer when we relocated back here to Northeast Ohio to be closer to some wonderful family we have here and also to take a position with a very unique organization called the In His Steps Foundation. We are able to grant or give many million dollars a year to local nonprofit ministries, parachurch organizations, and help uh, stewardship-minded Christian people be philanthropic with their dollars and their wealth. And, and so that's a, an adventure in and of itself. So I'm not a pastor. In fact, this church does have a pastor, Ben. And yes, it's confusing for me. Every single time somebody says Pastor Ben, I, I, I start to stand up. And so I'm just Ben, like the rest of you. Uh, I used to say sometimes that uh, I used to get paid to be good. And now, like the rest of you, I'm just good for nothing. So uh, we're all in this together. <laughs> and um, uh, it is uh, my privilege to get to share a couple of uh, thoughts with you today. Uh, our family, though, is thrilled about the opportunity we have to start carving out and creating a life here in this church learning how we can serve and, and little by little become friends and family together. Uh, one of the things that's, that's unique about my family, I think, is that we have a big commitment to opening our home and sharing meals together uh, as a church family. So my prayer is that over the years, many of you enjoy a meal with us at our home and something else we love. We love being invited to your house. 
for lunch and, and dinner. We seldom say no. And the reason I'm so bold and brash about saying that is because I think when the church is practicing hospitality and neighborliness in those ways, um, we're never a better version of ourselves. Uh, so if you don't want to invite me over, and you can make your mind up after today, uh, invite somebody else to your house for lunch. You and the church and them are better for it. Amen? Okay, that is the uh, quick abridged autobiography. Uh, let's step into some other thoughts here today. I really don't enjoy talking about myself, but I'm, I'm using this to kind of introduce you to me, and, and let's go forward together. So let's, let's talk about something we all have in common. We experienced an extraordinary Sunday last week, didn't we? I love baptisms. The only thing I love better than a church baptism is, is an outdoor baptism. I love hearing testimonies. I love seeing disciples of Jesus taking a public step forward in their journey toward obedience. It's simply spectacular. In fact, I'm so inspired by baptisms and by what I witnessed last Sunday with you that I, I took a, a detour of, of my prepared thoughts and really felt the Lord leading a, a heavy burden on my spirit to preach a message specifically to those people who were baptized in our church's recent past. And so I titled the sermon, you can see, To the Newly Baptized. And this sermon is built around a couple of questions. The first is, if I had a handful of minutes to talk to the newly baptized Christians from Bedford Church of the Nazarene on a Sunday morning, what would I say? Or you might say, what is so important that it simply cannot go unsaid? So after thinking about it a little bit, here's, here's part of what I, I decided I want you to know about. One, I want you to know about this great tradition you've inherited. Two is I want you to know about this extraordinary family that you've been adopted into. And three, I desperately want you to know about the living story that you are helping to write. And so for the rest of you who maybe have not yet joined this living story of the God who created the world, saving the world, my hope today is that you hear and find something so compelling as we talk about this Jesus, that you want to lean in and become part of that story. And I'm going to create space for you to do that today. And then maybe some of you, like me, were baptized in the distant past decades ago, but I think maybe remembering some of what we were baptized into is worth its while. So let's start in an unusual way. I've never heard a, a pastor open a sermon this way. I don't think we marvel enough about what we're doing here. I don't think we're sufficiently amazed at what happens here on a Sunday morning. Do you ever think about how remarkable it is that so many of us from so many diverse backgrounds have voluntarily chosen to give up our Sunday to be here together in this room today? Black people, white people, every beautiful color in between, old people, young people, rich people, poor people, attractive people. Just kidding. You know I wouldn't say that. <laughs> we don't really have any... You guys over here were like, wait, what's he, who's, he, who's he pointing out? We don't really have anything in common with each other, honestly. Where else in the world does such a diverse, random sampling of people get together in a room, huddled together around a common cause? I mean, consider with me. You got up today. You got dressed. You invested energy to make it to this sanctuary in Bedford, Ohio, in the United States of America, on the North American continent in the year 2019, only because 2,000 years ago, across the Atlantic Ocean, a Middle Eastern, foreign language speaking, itinerant teacher gathered some people together around his ideas. On a Friday, about the year 30 something AD, outside the northern wall, the northern walls of Jerusalem, those ideas, that movement that Jesus started, was just a hair's width away from being lost in obscurity. Just the failed teachings or ideology of yet another crucified revolutionary. Of course, after Jesus died, his followers scattered. The movement flatlined. You know that sound you hear when a body is hooked up to a heart monitor that But on the third day, 
There was a blip. gaining steam, getting faster, and the blip even began to to take on the sound of a heartbeat until finally the breath of his father was breathed into Jesus and he burst forth from the tomb. Unsurprisingly, 11 of those 12 disciples gathered back together around this movement. Shortly thereafter, the number grew to 120. By early summer of that year, 3,000 more people had been baptized and joined this movement. Little by little, this peculiar, unusual, little community of resurrection people began to grow. Not by force, not by any measure of political influence or power, not through any advertising or marketing campaign, not through the ability of having a a, a remarkable building, not even with the use of a Bible. One author, and an eyewitness to much of this, named Luke, who fancied himself a historian, wrote down this early experience of these first Christians. And we have this in our Bible, in the gospel or the the book of Acts, chapter 2. These are going to be very familiar words to you. You can follow along on the screen, or I'm happy to read them to you and for you. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They, these, these early Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. We will see very soon thereafter they were entirely kicked out of the temple courts. So they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, this odd, peculiar, peaceful, generous life that these followers of Jesus were carving out for each other began to attract attention. The Roman Empire started to notice their growing influence. And like hellfire, widespread persecution of this young community of Jesus followers began to break out around the world. Many were hunted, killed, driven underground to hide, to live, and to worship in caves that we call catacombs. In the Roman Empire, roughly about the year 100 AD or so, there were probably fewer than about 25,000 Christians in the entire world. This time in history marked the turning point when the Caesars began to wage a war on Christians. You fast forward through 200 years of unspeakable, unimaginable, intense persecution until finally you arrive at the year about 313 or so when at that time the Roman Emperor Constantine decided to end the state-sponsored persecution of Christians. And as slowly these Christians started to come out of hiding, come out of the shadows into the light, nobody was prepared for what emerged. There were more than 20 million Christians spread around the empire. 25,000 to 20 million throughout the course of 200 bloody, horrific years. How? The more that Caesar's government tried to crush this movement, and the more they killed their pastors and leaders and took away every available resource, and the more they persecuted the church in all of its forms, the faster it seemed to grow. Uh, One eyewitness to these events named Tertullian, he he wrote this very, very well-known phrase. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You murder one congregation here and five more show up over here. There was an unstoppable energy. There was this life force like a mighty wind that just seemed to blow and no one could slow or stop down this movement. It was like the harder it was to be a Christian, the more that that Caesar had his boot on your neck trying to suffocate and choke the life out of you, the more this counter cultural movement of Jesus shined even brighter and was more beautiful and attractive to everybody who saw it. And guys, this has always been the story of the church throughout the ages. Come with me, even as recently as the 20th century. 
When the Chinese general, Chairman Mao, took over China in the 1930s, there were maybe two million Christians in the country. In those days, he, he banished all missionaries, all pastors. He confiscated all church property, killed as many senior leaders as he could find, imprisoned the rest, banned all public Christian gatherings. In the 1970s, Mao died, and Westerners, for the first time in two generations, were allowed back into the country. And nobody had any idea what they would find waiting for them in China. I mean, would there even be any Christians left? Who could survive all of that for so long? Well, what they found was absolutely astounding. 40 million Christians were waiting and were discovered in the country of China. Today, just a couple decades later, that number is 80 to 100 million. And in a decade or so from now, that number is expected to be a quarter of a billion people. It's extraordinary. I am constantly amazed at how big, how wide, and how deep this story continues to grow against all odds, against all logic, and against all reason. It just grows. One moment in my life brought this home in a pretty profound way. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is to go to Israel. It's a, a passion of mine, and during one recent trip, I was in the Judean desert down by where the Red Sea is, and we had hiked deep into the oasis of En Gedi. You can read about that in the Bible. And we made our way to a magnificent waterfall. You can see it on the screen. And this, this waterfall, let me tell you, is in the middle of the middle of nowhere. This is hard place to reach. A small group of us were milling around, and I noticed there were some Koreans present, some Germans present, some Australians, us Americans, and, and a handful of other groups. I want to show you a photo of something extraordinary that happened in that moment. Some of the Germans started singing a song that we all know, Amazing Grace. But they were singing it in their own language, but the tune remained the same. It didn't take long for the Koreans and the Australians and, of course, the Americans and who knows who else was there to start joining in in their own language. And I am sitting up on this rock. Someone took that exact photo of me on that rock, looking down, and I took the photo of the group of people. And as I'm watching this scene unfold, I can't stop the tears from just streaming down my face. This moment that was happening built on the teachings, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. It left Palestine. It made its way all the way around the world. And now the citizens of the world are making their way back to where this whole story started. It's extraordinary. And now here we are in Bedford, Ohio, sitting in this thing that we call church. We should be amazed at what we're doing here. It's remarkable. So let me say this to the newly baptized. You have joined a family that spans the entire globe. It's a big family, and it's a good family. Welcome home. Welcome home. This tradition of faith that has very much been entrusted to you was lovingly protected at great cost so that it could reach you and me. You know, those saints of old hung, clung very tightly to a particular teaching of Jesus. Some of the last words he said before his ascension into heaven, Jesus said this in Acts chapter 1. He said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. But what they knew intimately is something either we don't know or we don't want to think about. And that is that the word for witness, the Greek word for witness, it's the origin of our word for martyr. Jesus said, you will be my martyrs. A martyr is somebody who, if necessary when called upon, is willing to die for a cause. In fact, here's what I, I want to do. I'm going to invite you, if you'll trust me, just to close your eyes right where you're seated. Just in this moment, close your eyes and keep them closed. I will tell you when to open them in about two minutes, if you will. And I want you to hear Jesus rephrasing these familiar words with some new language. To the church throughout the ages, Jesus says, 
you will be the ones that have called upon will be willing to die for me and for the integrity of the story I've entrusted you to pass on, to keep alive, to keep burning for future generations. We're here today only because so many great saints of old were willing to die for us to make sure the story made it to us. When we talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus, we need to remember what happened to his hands and feet. Adoption into this global family comes with a great inheritance, reward, and blessing. Amen. But it also comes with a tremendous responsibility to live this story faithfully. Open your eyes, if you will. Quick aside, this very spring on March 24th, my wife and I are leading a group of, of uh, mostly Nazarene Christians from about six different states now to Israel, taking a 10-day trip, and we're going to see En Gedi, Jerusalem, the Sea of Galilee, all of these sites. And if there's ever been a, a seed of desire in your heart to take a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to see where this story began, uh, we would love to uh, maybe invite anyone in this company here to, to join us with one of the five, six, or seven slots I, I may still have available on that trip. Uh, just if you're curious and want to learn more, I did put some flyers at the Welcome Center out there as you exit. So against every conceivable probability, today Christianity is the world's largest religion. How did we get here? How did we get here? Well, here is Christianity's secret sauce. Here's the magic, the way this whole thing works. I want to give you the recipe born out of two very specific stories from my own life, two stories that taught me more about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus than, frankly, anything I ever learned at seminary. Here's the first story. I mentioned to you that, that my wife and I planted a church several years ago. It was a unique church, and for reasons I don't really know, God brought us a lot of people who were vegans and vegetarians. Our congregation was probably about 85 or so percent meat, non-meat eaters. We had a Thanksgiving dinner as a church. We had a tofurkey present. There was no meat allowed at the Thanksgiving dinner. So like most pastors would do, probably like you would have done, honestly, I, I, I wanted to join my people where they were, and so one day I decreed, I'm going to become a vegetarian. It seemed like a fairly straightforward observation, but what I didn't really figure out was how quickly this was going to require me to rethink almost every aspect of my life. I had a business trip coming up, and I, I thought, how do I eat when I'm on the road? Are there any fast food restaurants that, that a, a, veg or a vegetarian or a, a vegan could, could eat at? What do you do when you're at somebody's house and you don't want to seem rude, but all they've got is a plate of meat to give you? Is this way of life even healthy. And, and what is tofu anyway? <laughs> so what I did is I realized I, I needed practical, real-world help. People with experience who have navigated what feels like a brave new world, I needed to talk to them. So I invited some of my friends, and they sat around my kitchen table, and I just peppered them with a thousand questions. And eventually, some of them said to me, they said, look, Ben, I know this feels overwhelming. But don't worry. We got you. You're going to be okay. We'll show you what we know, but also just spend time with us. Watch how we do it. Eat with us. And what I intuitively knew was that this new way of being was going to require a community of people who had been walking this way for a while to teach me what they had learned along the way. Do you remember last Sunday, Pastor Mike introduced us to the story of Lydia from the Bible? Lydia was a leader in the garment industry, exotic cloth and fabric, and, and one day she heard Paul preaching down by the river. She was baptized, became a disciple of Jesus. Awesome. But my thought is, as Lydia began to more and more faithfully walk with Jesus as his disciple, did her life get less complicated or more? In the church, we have this saying we like to say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's not untrue, but we seldom consider just how disruptive meeting Jesus can really be. You see, Lydia had to relearn what it meant to go to work every day as a disciple of Jesus. Now, as a 
truth-telling person of integrity who had to honor the image of God imprinted upon every person up and down her supply chain. Now Lydia had to learn to rethink everything she knew about being a wife, a mother, a daughter, that stood in much contrast to the dominant cultural norms of her day. This is the kind of rethinking, relearning Jesus was calling people to. If you remember the scriptures, Jesus went around the countryside. Everywhere he went, he was calling people to repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I spent most of my life thinking that really repent just meant feel bad for the things you had just done. That may be part of it, but there's something much more interesting happening. The Greek word, this idea for repent, comes from the word um, metanoia. It's the origin of our idea of metamorphosis. Metanoia means to wake up, to see reality as it actually is, to expand, to open up, to have new eyes. In other words, to reimagine, relearn, rethink. So in my own instance, does, does becoming a vegetarian seem like it would be disruptive to your way of life? Sure. It was. Of course it was. But it should be and would be nothing compared to the disruption of meeting Jesus. Walking the Jesus path, living this great story, requires nothing short of rethinking, relearning everything you know about marriage, work, business, manhood, womanhood, parenthood, sexuality, money, time, purpose, identity, calling, all of it. Jesus will challenge and frustrate you as much as he will heal and restore you. So this is really hard. In fact, some would call it next to impossible, which it is. Which brings me to the second experience in my life I want to share with you. Quick public service announcement. About a year after we left that church, I was around the dinner table. Uh, some friends from church were having dinner with us, and Marcy had grilled up a, a, a series of big, juicy cheeseburgers. And uh, I, I took a look and, and just said, I, I think I've come to the formal end of this season of my life. And uh, enjoyed, we, we caught on video of me eating that, that cheeseburger. It was a good three-year experiment, but I'm with you now. I'm one of you. <laughs> Second story, and this is the last story I'm going to share today. I come from a family of alcoholics. Addiction has killed the majority of the uncles and grandparents and relatives that I've had. It almost killed my brother Derek, but what ultimately saved his life was his introduction to the recovery community, specifically Alcoholics Anonymous. When you walk into an AA meeting, you are entering a community of amazing people. In AA, there is no pretending, no mask wearing, no posturing, just brutally honest people. When someone walks into AA, they already know, I can't help myself by myself. I need someone to help me and I'm not afraid to admit it. You know, if I had one wish, it would be that church folk were half as honest with themselves, one another and God as AA folk. Amen, indeed. So my brother Derek, he had been sober for a couple of weeks, and he confided in me. And we had this conversation because he was living with me. He, he moved from another state to be with my family during this time. And he said, Ben, I don't know how to be sober. What do sober people do for fun? What do sober people get together and talk about? Where do sober people hang out? How does a sober person celebrate the holidays? How do you navigate conflict and difficult seasons without alcohol? These were just real honest questions. And I don't know if we have any addicts in the room that can relate to this, but, but if we do, I'm so proud of you. You're my hero because you are fighting the fight, and that is awesome. Amen, indeed. <laughs> Derek, my brother, had to unlearn 20 years of sickness and death and completely relearn a different way of being in the world. If we were going to slap a religious label on it, you know what we'd say? Derek had to repent. Metanoia, he had to wake up and see things differently. So here, here's the deal. I promised you the secret sauce 
of how Christianity has stayed as vibrant and as living and humming as it has for 2,000 years. You ready? Here it is. It's summed up in AA's 12th and final step. This is what you do after all the lessons have been learned and you've, you've kind of walked the program, you've gone through the steps. This is it. Let me read it, an abridged version of it for you. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we resolve to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. So if you're committed to finding new life in this bold, scary world of sobriety, you don't have a prayer unless you find a sponsor. Here's the definition of a sponsor. Sponsors share their experience, strength, and hope with their sponsees. A sponsor is simply another addict in recovery who is willing to share his or her journey through the 12 steps. So my brother, Derek, he'd been in for a couple of weeks and somebody tapped him on the shoulder and they said, can I follow you? Would you be my sponsor? You know, you might expect somebody to say, no, dude, I'm still a recovering addict too. I don't have all the answers. I'm a million miles from perfect, but it doesn't matter. AA doesn't work like that. This, this person who's an AA, who's, who's just a, a few steps further down the road of sobriety than, than someone else, might say if, if someone tapped them on the shoulder, they might say to that person, all I have has been given to me by somebody else. All I know was taught to me by somebody else. If I can and it's helpful, I will take the cup that others have poured into mine and I will pour it into yours if you're willing. And so Derek was given access to his sponsor. He got a phone number. They met in a small group outside of a big group gathering on a weekly basis. And when the voices in his head started to fill his mind with lies, Derek would pick up the phone and say, I need help. Those demons, they're, they're crawling at my skin. I can feel myself reverting back into the old ways. Talk me through this. Be here with me. What do I need to know? Show me how to live in this strange world of sobriety that's so foreign to me. Now, here's the best part. Here's the best part. Guess what happened to Derek once he'd been in AA just a little while. He'd attended a few meetings. He's learning. He's got a sponsor whose path that he's following. And, and Derek has made just a tiny bit of progress. He got a tap on his shoulder from somebody else who was holding with quivering, shaking hands a 24-hour sobriety chip who just stood there in awe of Derek's three-month chip. And this person said to Derek, can I follow you? Will you show me what it is you've learned on this journey? And Derek, like any addict, knows the only way this fire stays lit inside of me is if I'm giving it away. You see, in NAA, there's no such thing as an addict. Only addicts teaching and showing other addicts what they've learned along the way. In the church, there is no such thing as a Christian. There are only Christians who are showing other people what they've learned along the way. And in the church, these people form an unbroken chain. You see, people are reaching out with one hand forward, latching onto somebody who's cheering for them. And it's somebody who is further down the road than they are. And they've learned some things. And this person who's in front of me is pulling me, dragging me into God's future for my life to a world I can't even imagine at this point. I'm holding on for dear life. But I'm also looking behind me, looking back at somebody who has been on the road a little less than me, who's a little behind me, and I can recognize and see in them some of the hangups that I used to have. And I'm pulling them along for the journey, pouring whatever I have in my cup into theirs. And folks, this is the church, an unbroken chain of people that stretches 2,000 years into the past to our founder, Jesus. Follow me, 
wrote Paul, as I follow the example of Christ. This is the secret sauce. This is the magic that has kept this thing propelling through history for 2,000 years. And if you're here today and you're part of this family of redeemed, healed saints, you are part of that chain. You are part of this connection of people that can be traced in an unbroken sequence all the way back to Jesus. Isn't that cool? You're part of this thing, and so am I. We all are. So as we prepare to bring things to a close this morning, I, I want to give you just some time and space to reflect on a couple of, I think, important questions. As you think about the meaningful relationships that you have that are present in your life today, here's the first question. Who is pouring their cup of wisdom and experience into yours? Who's just a little bit further along the journey, just down the path from you, that you're learning from? You know you're allowed to ask somebody, can I follow you as you're following Jesus? Second and last, but just as important, because without the second part, the whole thing falls apart. Into whose cup are you pouring your little bit of experience, little bit of knowledge, little bit of wisdom that you've picked up throughout the days and ages? To whose cup are you pouring what you have? Who's behind you that you've brought along beside you? You know you're allowed to invite somebody to say, come, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, sometime in the recent past, our church, and I love being able to say that with you, our church made a decision about the way we were going to invest our time, our money, our programming. And does this church, does the world need another busy, complicated church program? Or does the world need disciples meeting in small groups, hashing out, asking transparent, hard, difficult, encouraging, life-giving questions, and walking this journey of discipleship together. And so the idea was, was formed, let's create these things that Pastor Paul on the video alluded to called D-groups, disciple groups. Three, four, five men or or that many number of women who agree to meet outside of this space, because there's very little discipleship that can happen in rows. It just isn't. We can be inspired in this place. We can learn in this place, but we can't be discipled in this room. Discipleship happens out there. And so the idea was, could we meet out there together and learn and live from one another? To me, it's a remarkably simple idea but it is the idea that Jesus modeled for us, that Jesus taught us, and it's the idea that has been propelling the church into the future for 2,000 years. I would encourage you to take Pastor Paul up on his invitation to reach out and say, I don't know about this, but it might feel like the next step in my journey of discipleship. Can I pray for you? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for joining us in this room. You have been here with us, you have been, been among us, and you will follow us outside of these doors into a world that's waiting for us. And Lord, just thinking about these thoughts, I pray that for my brothers and sisters here in this place today, that you would compel us to spend some time sitting with these questions. Who is that person in my life that's just a little bit further down the road, whose maturity I respect, whose path I admire, who maybe has some aspects or character traits I look up to, that maybe myself and some of my, my brothers and sisters here might, might reach out to and cling on to and, and ask to follow, ask to learn from, ask to share life with in some ways. And Lord, at the same time, we understand that we have been given a, a tremendous and terrific responsibility of looking over our shoulder 
at who is limping behind us, who is struggling to keep up, who is not quite where they might be. If only they had someone to put an arm around and walk with them into the future that you want them to realize. Lord, may it be said of us, of this church, of these people, that we are part of this unbroken chain that extends back to you. And Lord, in closing, before we say an amen, my, my heart grieves for the one or two or more that may be here today that, that frankly aren't part of this magnificent family we've been here to celebrate today. As we've been talking about this idea of belonging to something so big, so deep, so wide, they realize that they're on the sidelines of this great work that you're doing in the world. Father, they may not have the vocabulary or even the words to say how their heart is feeling a longing to connect with you today. Would your spirit speak to that person or these people that, that want to become part of this story, that want to be adopted into this family, that want to receive this wonderful tradition of faith that's been given to us? And Lord, would you just impress upon their spirit, Lord, that in their longing, in their desiring to call out to you, Jesus, Lord, that you would just saturate their being with your big yes to them your wide open acceptance of them. And then Lord, would you take these people and plug them in, put them on my mind, put them on a, another believer's mind, Lord, and then con convict them with the courage to reach out and to grab a hand of someone who's on this path already. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gift that we've been given today. And I pray that you would follow us out these doors as we seek to do our best to walk the difficult journey of discipleship in Bedford, Ohio, and beyond this week. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Well, church, before we, we leave here together, let me leave you with a benediction. This is to all the baptized saints that are in the room today. May you receive with a joy and a reverence the great tradition that has been lovingly passed down to you. And may you learn to love the extraordinary local and global family that you've been adopted into. And may you write new chapters in the living story that our life is writing together. Amen indeed. God bless you, church. You are dismissed. Thank you.